Today I'm going to show you guys the math that goes into finding derivatives of inverse trig functions. And before I get too far into that, I just want to mention something that sometimes throws people off. So I want to just quickly show you how inverse trig functions work. A lot of times people forget this. So just what do you do if you suddenly realize that you don't remember how the function works and you need to know how to do that? So here, let me just show you a quick way of how I do that. So this is desmos.com. So you can see desmos, that's how you spell it. So if you've watched my channel, you know I love this website. So I've pulled up one of the inverse trig functions, so inverse sine. So if you ever get into a jam and you're like realizing that you don't really remember much about these functions, what I recommend that you do is take a second to graph it and then also take a second to appreciate the domain and range. So in this case, I can pretty easily pick it out. So I can see actually this, this particular graph has endpoints. So this goes from negative one, negative pi over two to one pi over two. So sometimes you're going to find that you'll want to take, you know, a minute just to kind of appreciate this because it will make your life easier when you work with these functions. So using those endpoints that I just saw in that graph, so remember we said we went from negative one to negative pi over two and then one to pi over two, that translates to this domain and range. And so I don't wanna go through all the functions here. So here are the domain and ranges of a couple other of the inverse trig functions. I highly recommend that you at least pause the video and write these down if you don't remember these. And like I said, if you, if you find that these functions are getting really difficult for you, then I also suggest that you take a moment to look at the graphs, but you can, you can do that on your own. And then here's the other list of these. And again, you can pause the video. Okay. So let's get into the lesson. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how do you actually find these derivatives? So I'm not just going to show you the rule. I'm going to show you why this works. It's kind of cool logic actually. So as it is, I don't have a derivative rule for this. So there's nothing I can do with this. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to take sine of each side of this equation. So here's what I mean. I take sine of y and I take sine of sine, inverse sine of x. Okay, so in doing this, what does this become? Whenever a function is composed with its inverse, there's a property that says that this will just equal x now. So we're just left with x on the right side. And in doing this, what I've done is I've actually created something that I can take the derivative of, right? This whole thing I could differentiate. I just have to do so implicitly. So let's implicitly differentiate. So if I take the derivative of sine y, that will give me cosine y dy dx. And then on the other side, the derivative of x is just one. And then I can go through and I can solve for dy dx and I get one over cosine of y. Okay, so now we need to think about this for a moment. What happens if I replace y? So let me make some space and then I'll make that replacement. Okay, so I was at this line. So now I have replaced y with inverse sine of x. That, so that was exactly where we started, right? Well, there's, there's a problem with this. This is meaningless, right? We, we can't really do anything with this. This doesn't tell us anything. We don't know how to simplify this anymore. So the question is, how can we manipulate cosine to make it more meaningful? What kind of things can we do to this? So as you think through what you know about trig and trig properties, there's the the kind of the favorite trig identity. So sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals one. So can I take this, one of our favorite, uh, you know, trig identities or properties, can, can I take this and manipulate it to relate it back to cosine? So I can, right? I could actually technically solve for cosine. So if I do that, first I'll subtract off the sine squared, and then I can take the square root like this. And so check this out. Now I can actually replace where I had cosine, I can now replace it with this. So what I want to do is I basically want to take this square root and replace it into cosine. So let's, let's see what that looks like. So I have left just here was what we were going to replace. And so look at how I made that replacement. So I just basically wherever this was now I've replaced it with this uh, square root. Okay. Now in looking at this, is this meaningful? Can I simplify this farther? This I could not, but this I can, right? Because I've got sine of inverse sine. So this whole thing can now be simplified to one more step. And so this sine squared of sine inverse or inverse sine 
will just become x squared, and it's squared from this part up here. And so check it out. Now what I have actually is the derivative. So just to summarize that, our derivative of the inverse sine function is going to be 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And this is also, uh, we have to require that the absolute value of x has to be less than 1. And that just relates back to the domain and range conversation that we were having earlier. So you'll notice with a lot of these that we have restrictions on um, our domains, and that has to do with just exactly what we reviewed. Okay, so moving on, now let's talk about how do you find the derivative of inverse tangent. Well, once again, we don't know how to take this derivative as is, so we're going to use a similar trick. This time we're going to take the tangent of each side. And so if I do that, it's going to look like this. And so then once again, I have this thing where if I take the tangent of inverse tangent, this will all kind of drop out, so I'm just left with tangent of y equals x. And now we can work with this once again, right? So I can take the derivative of tangent. So this is good. So we're going to implicitly differentiate. And so if I do that, I get secant squared y dy dx equals 1. And then I can solve for dy dx to get 1 over secant squared y. OK. So if you think about just where we're at right now, kind of the, the general goal of this is to eventually replace y with kind of our original function. And if I were to put the inverse tangent into this right now, we'd have the same problem that we did in the last, like the last derivative. It wouldn't be very meaningful. So once again, we're going to have to manipulate this secant squared y so that we can actually kind of finish the derivative. So in this case, what is kind of the, the, the trig identity or, or property that we want to work with? So in this case, what we're going to want to use is the fact that secant squared x equals 1 plus tangent squared x. And so uh, let, me, let me make some space. Okay, so there's some space. And so now what I want to do is say, oh, hey, I can totally work with this. So basically now where I have that secant squared, I'm now going to replace it with 1 plus tangent squared. So here's what it's going to look like. So I've got 1 plus tangent squared y. And now I can plug the y back into it. So I've now done this trick kind of two different ways. So two different ways you can think about it. You can either replace y right away or you can replace y later. So if there was a particular way that you prefer seeing that, that's fine. You can kind of change the order of, of these a little bit. And now I can go ahead and actually evaluate and simplify this. So tangent squared of the inverse tangent of x, what's that going to come out to? Well, I'm, I'm running out of room here, so I'll just I'll clear a little space. And so this will just be 1 over 1 plus x squared. So slightly easier derivative than the last one. So just to, to round that out, so the derivative of the inverse tangent function is 1 over 1 plus x squared. And we know that the domain is all real numbers, so we don't have to worry about restricting the domain in this case. Okay, so now for the next one. So what about inverse secant? So by now you probably kind of see the idea behind this. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to take the secant of each side. But I will tell you that this does have a little bit of a plot twist. So this will, this will be interesting. Okay, so I go ahead and I take secant of each side. And so then we have that we just get secant y of x. And then once again, we can implicitly differentiate. Okay. So if I implicitly differentiate, this is where everything's going to get a little crazy. So now I've got secant y tangent y dy dx equals 1. And so then if I solve that, so I've got now dy dx is 1 over secant y tangent y. All right, so in this problem, now we've really got two different functions that we have to think about carefully. So let's start with the first one, so with secant y. So notice that with secant y, if I just replace my y, so this this right here, if I make this replacement right into this, this will be meaningful right away. We can make a simplification. So this I don't have to manipulate at all, right? Because if I just plug sec inverse secant right into this, we can do something with this. But tangent y, if I plug my y into this, this is going to be a problem. So we need to manipulate the tangent y. And we can actually use that same property from before. So tangent squared x plus 1 equals secant squared x. So I can manipulate this and 
So let me let me make a little room and then we'll manipulate this. So um, okay, so if I were to evaluate this, so I will get that this is actually going to be equal to plus or minus the square root of secant squared x minus 1. And now you might be saying, well, why did you have this one as plus or minus the square root versus the previous problem that we did, we didn't have plus or minus. So that all has to come back to kind of our, our domain restrictions. And so just because of how um, tangent squared works and, and how all of these functions work, in, for this particular one, we're going to have to include the, the plus or minus here. But, okay, so this is something I can work with, right? So once again, I, I've got this down to a place where I can replace this tangent with this thing that now has this secant squared x. So I can make all of these replacements. So I'm, I'm going to do a lot. You might even want to pause the video here just to make sure you're kind of following all the replacements I made. So here I've got my, my secant, and then I replaced my y with my inverse secant. And then this one, this is the manipulation I just made over here. And I plugged in also what my y is, so this inverse secant. So I've got all of this. So I know I've still got this plus or minus here. I'm going to resolve this in a second. So one thing that might be helpful at this point is to go back and just review the domain and range of our inverse secant because that's going to, to also kind of help us resolve this plus or minus. Okay, so if I just resolve what I can algebraically without worrying about the plus or minus for a moment, here's how everything will simplify. So secant of inverse secant will just become x, and then the secant squared of inverse secant, this will become x squared. So we've got that part. So now let's talk about the plus or minus. Okay, so if you think about the actual domain domain and range for um, inverse secant, so you might want to just go back and look at your notes for that. So you have that either x is going to be greater than 1 or it's going to be less than negative 1. And so this function is actually going to be, it's going to be positive when x is greater than 1. And then we take the negative version of this when x is less than negative 1. But if you think about this, so if this is what happens, and if I'm, this is, this is the function that I go to when I plug in an x that's less than negative 1, that means that this x here will be negative and this is a negative, so the whole thing ends up becoming positive. So now what we can do is we can manipulate this to just force it to, to basically always be positive. So the, the manipulation that we made to make to this is we drop the plus or minus and we just put an absolute value here and then we don't have to worry about this because we know that this function is always going to end up being being positive so here's here's your derivative and there's the actual derivative rules you can you can note that and so now we have well what about these derivatives so we've got the derivative of inverse cosine, inverse cotangent, inverse cosecant. So we actually have a really slick way of dealing with these. We don't have to repeat those, those proofs. So we have these things called cofunction identities. So for inverse cosine, this is equivalent to pi over 2 minus inverse sine. And then inverse cotangent has one and inverse cosecant has one. So you can, you can see them all listed here. So we have these identities. We can rewrite these functions like this, and this will help us to take the derivatives. So for instance, if I have, if I want to take the derivative of inverse cosine, so if I, if I try to set this up, basically what I can do is I can call on that co-function identity, and I know the derivative of this, right? So we just figured that out. So the derivative of pi over 2 is 0. So really we're just left with the negative derivative of inverse sine. So that would be how you'd get to that one. And then if I wanted to do this for inverse cotangent, so I would do the same thing. So as I try to take the derivative, I just call in that cofunction identity. And once again, I just get the negative version of that derivative. And then the same thing is going to happen with a cosecant when I try to take the derivative, call in the cofunction identity. You just get the negative version of that derivative. So that part's nice and simple once you kind of lay out the derivatives of the other ones. So just to review, those are the derivatives um, of those three functions. And so if you are in my class, you do have to have these, these memorized. These are something that you will be asked about on the test. So you'll definitely want to go through and write these down. You won't be asked on the actual proofs, but I think it's just a good higher level thinking practice to actually go through and, and review how these work. So that covers it for this video, guys. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.